Tim wasn't necessarily a loner. He was remembered as being kind of an outgoing kid. And I never saw Tim get me in the whole life. A real soldier, soldier, but very quiet, uh, somewhat introverted. He was the type of person who drifted from town to town. He saw gun ownership as a symbol of liberty. He actually had the standard American values that most Americans indeed believe that government and country are two separate things, that you can love your country and hate your government. The explosion took away what appears to be nearly one third of the building. The entire front is gone. A terrible explosion. It's just like an atomic bomb went off. The story is in Oklahoma City. Take a look at this. This is a federal office building in downtown Oklahoma City. It's called the Murrah Building. It is right in the center of town, and at 9 o'clock this morning, an explosion of unknown origin did this to the building. We have to have on the second floor. Second floor. 168 people died. 19 children were among the dead. More than 500 were injured. Terrorism on an unprecedented scale had invaded the heartland of America. After one of the most intensive manhunts in American history, the FBI arrested and charged 27-year-old Timothy McVeigh with the bombing. He was tried, convicted, sentenced to death, and finally executed in June 2001. Though his life is now over, his crime still raises important questions. Who was Timothy McVeigh? What led him to commit this act of terror? Timothy James McVeigh was born April 23, 1968, in Pendleton, New York, a typical American rural town of 5,000 outside Buffalo in western New York State. Pendleton was settled more than 100 years ago by German farmers who said it reminded them of home. Today, it is different. There are not many people that work here in Pendleton. There's no industry. There's a convenience store, and that's about it. One pizza parlor, quite rural. There's not much happening except, uh, except the people growing their gardens. Tim's parents were Bill and Mildred McVeigh. They were married in 1965. Bill, a devout church-going Catholic, worked nights at the General Motors plant in Lockport and devoted much of his free time to charity. Mildred, known as Mickey, worked days in a travel agency. They were rarely at home at the same time. The first of Bill and Mildred McVeigh's children, a daughter, Patty, was born in 1966. Tim, born in 1968, was the second child, followed by Jennifer, six years later. From the age of six, Timothy went to Star Point Central School with 500 other kids bussed in from neighboring towns. Tim, in his neighborhood, got to be pretty well known for being kind of an attention getter, an out, out, outgoing type kid. And he used to set up haunted houses. He enjoyed inviting the neighborhood kids over to his house to, uh, to have fun. And they had a pool. They were one of the only families uh, on Meyer Road in Pendleton who had a pool. For young Tim, there was more than the pool and good times. There was his introduction to guns, not unusual in rural America. For Timothy McVeigh, guns would become a lifelong passion. Tim was very close with his grandfather, Edward McVeigh, uh, who taught him at a very young age the importance of guns. And uh, his grandfather purchased a, a gun for uh, Tim. It was a little, uh, you know, a starter's uh, rifle type gun. And uh, he, ga he gave this gun to Tim as a present and uh, taught him how to use it. I know Tim was interested in guns. Uh, my wife signed his pistol permit, as a matter of fact, and he, she had no hesitation in doing that, and I know he did have a few guns. During the winter of 1977, Pendleton was hit by a severe blizzard. Tim was nine years old, and he was worried. Uh, he started storing water in the basement, as his grandfather had. He wanted to store food in the cellar, and he wanted to get a generator that they would keep down in the cellar, and this was where Bill McVeigh shut it off. He said, no, we're not buying a generator that we can keep in the cellar. But that's the, where the initial survivalism in Tim started. 
His early interest in survivalism taught Tim how to be alone, but it didn't mean he always kept to himself. He was to himself, but he was far from a loner. I mean, he, was, he would speak well. Uh, he wasn't an exhibitionist or anything like that. I saw him at our religious ed classes, and he certainly was, you know, one of the kids, um, got in his share of trouble, but it was never um, ostracized in any way. You know, he was one of the kids. By the time Tim was 10, his parents' marriage was in trouble. Bill McVeigh continued on the night shift because it paid well, but Mickey was bored and went to work at a local bowling alley. That seemed to be the time that uh, Mickey's eyes began to wander. And uh, she was unhappy with her home life, loved her children very deeply, and wanted to take care of them. Uh, still had a love for Bill, but not a love for marriage necessarily. Uh, there was a lot of men who liked Mickey very much. She was a very beautiful woman. Mickey started spending time away from home. She frequently left the town for long periods. It was something that affected Tim very deeply. He asked a friend of his father's if he was the cause of his parents' problems. He said to this uh, man, why is this happening? Is it something that I have done? Is, is it me? It was something that, that he began carrying with him that caused this maybe outgoing uh, young type of kid to somehow go inside of himself. And Tim stopped talking about his family. I have no idea why uh, she left. I mean, she was a pretty girl, and uh, she was good to the family, and, and Bill, I think, is a perfect husband. But again, behind closed doors, I have no idea what goes in. When Timothy was 16, Mickey left Bill McVeigh and Pendleton for good. She moved to Florida with her daughters. Tim decided to stay with his father. Tim didn't seem to change an awful lot because he was fortunate that he went to the same school, lived in the same house, had the same friends, and it seems to me he was on the track team and, you know, kept up pretty much the same schedule day after day. Dad worked in the same place and, uh, you know, his life didn't change an awful lot. Though his two sisters and mother were gone, not much else was different for Timothy McVeigh. High school graduation was on the horizon, and so were profound changes he would experience in the larger world outside Pendleton. In 1984, at the age of 16, Timothy McVeigh became a self-reliant teenager. With his mother and two sisters living in Florida, and his father still working nights, he learned to be on his own and to create his own interests. When Tim was in high school, he developed a computer program that was just very, very, very involved. He impressed his teachers to no end with this computer program of uh, uh, communicating through a modem. As far as inventive, I mean, it was uh, just an intelligence. It was just kind of breaking forth, just a smart kid. He was called the Wanderer on this computer system, and he was pretty well known, and people still talk about what he had done even today. Like many teenagers, he collected comic books and listened to rock music. Van Halen and Ozzy Osbourne were two of Tim's favorite groups. He worshipped the film Red Dawn, the story of school kids in Colorado resisting a Soviet invasion of the United States. Tim constantly read survivalist magazines and kept up his love of guns. One of his good friends, Justin Genter, recalled that Tim actually brought uh, some type of an air rifle type gun to school to show off to the other kids and uh, remembers him, Tim saying, I can stand in this uh, policeman type style and, and I can shoot just like a cop would. And he'd shoot off 15 rounds or however many uh, it would do. And, and the other kids were like, well, you know, that's nice and everything, but you know, that's not the type of thing that we're really interested in. There was more to Timothy McVeigh than guns and computers. Much else of what he did was quite average for a teenager. He became the regular babysitter for Molly and Paul McDermott his next door neighbors. When Tim came, he played with the kids, and so that was, that was great. And of course he also, I would check the refrigerator after he left, because he always had a voracious appetite, but stayed skinny as a rail. He was fun. He was the best babysitter I ever had. 
Most babysitters would come in, tell you to be quiet and watch television, put you to bed. Tim would come in, find out what we wanted to do that night. Um, sometimes he would play with myself and with Jenny if she was over, but a lot of the time he would spend the time with Paul and he'd bring little plastic aliens over and they would spend hours setting them up all over the house and then they'd have wars and they would they would come and they would um, sweep them all up and take them off to Mars. Toward the end of high school, Tim and his friends sometimes went drinking 30 miles north of Pendleton in Niagara Falls, Canada. But Tim was rarely seen on a date. Other kids in school remember Tim always calling the beautiful girls up, the prettiest girls, uh, and them always saying no. He never wanted to settle. He always wanted the moon. But he was never able to connect with one who had the same interest in him as he did in her. Tim stayed interested in the church because of his father Bill's strong influence. For his confirmation, Liz McDermott had planned an all-day retreat. But Tim thought it was important to follow the rules in high school and at first refused to go. And he said, well, I have a perfect attendance record all through high school, and this would take that away. And I talked to the superintendent at the time, and he was not marked absent, and he got his perfect attendance. Though in school every day, Tim's grades were less than perfect. He was a good student, getting mostly A's, B's, and an occasional C. He was not an honor student, but he uh, spent time with the, uh, the honors kids because they recognized that he was as smart as they were. So he was a social, outgoing type guy, but very quiet and introverted when it came to family matters. If you asked him about his family, he may say, yeah, my parents are split, that's it. After he graduated from Star Point Central in 1986, like many 18-year-olds, Tim was unsure what he would do with his life. Welcome, Burke, in nice to order. Yeah, Good jobs were not easy to find in upstate western New York. That summer, he worked at a Burger King and registered at a local business college. Like other bright students, he had received a New York State Regent scholarship. It was only for $500, so his father agreed to help pay his tuition. McVeigh was extremely good with computers, started a computer bulletin board. So he went into college to study computer programming. The academic subjects of your first two years in college evidently were rather boring to Timothy, and he was unable or unwilling to continue the curriculum, dropped out after a semester. He saw an ad for a job as an armored car guard, something that appealed to him, uh, and he got a, on his 19th birthday, he got a concealed carry permit and uh, for an automatic pistol. McVeigh was a good employee. He showed up to work on time every day and took his job seriously. But there were some troubling signs. His continuing fascination with firearms led to some unusual incidents, like his bringing extra heavy weapons to work. He came in a few times with, you know, shotgun shells, at least 25 of them with a shotgun. Just like, you know, Rambo, you know, gun ho came to work one day as a joke to a supervisor with bandoliers of 12-gauge shotgun shells around himself, as well as a 12-gauge uh, pump shotgun with a pistol grip. The supervisor didn't like the joke at all and uh, sent Tim home. He would sometimes get very angry on the armored car uh, for no apparent reason, and he would just fly into a rage. One of the co-workers indicated that this rage was incredible. He would get red in the face and be screaming. He was angry one minute, then he was normal the next minute. And that's the way he was. Whether it was frustration at work or pent-up rage over his parents' divorce, it is unknown why Tim angered so quickly. But he never confronted anybody, nor did he ever look for any revenge in any relationships uh, with people that we can determine. When Tim was almost 20, he wanted an isolated site to shoot his guns. With a close friend, he bought 10 acres of land near Ole in New York, 90 miles from Pendleton. Never interested in hunting, Timothy enjoyed firing at targets. The idea of going out shooting a deer and bringing it home and gutting it wasn't really for Tim. That's kind of disgusting for him. He had more of, a, of the attitude where he liked guns. He collected them for their monetary value. Timothy did not see his future in security, and the chance of a good job with a future in Pendleton did not exist. 
One night, Tim was listening to his father and some friends talking. Them and they said, well, there's really nothing for you. And one of them kind of jokingly said, why don't you join the military? Tim took that very seriously. He told his father, Dad, I'm joining the Army. His father said when, and his son told him tomorrow. It was a surprise to everybody in Mr. McVeigh's hometown. On May 30th, 1988, six days after enlisting, Tim was in Fort Benning, Georgia, to start basic training. On the same day, a farmer named Terry Nichols arrived from Michigan and was placed in McVeigh's unit. Nichols was 12 years older than Tim. They became fast friends, and their paths would cross many times over the next seven years. Immediately, Timothy McVeigh found a home in the Army. He was a perfect soldier. I mean, he was someone who was very dedicated, very committed. I mean, they sort of used to look at him sort of askance because he used to make sure that it was, you know, spit and polish beyond everybody else. He was pretty young to be a sergeant. He was one of the first guys to get promoted in the unit to sergeant. Um, not many people had a problem with that because we all figured he pretty much earned it. He was somebody who read uh, manuals on tanks and guns and weapons from front to back constantly. Just a, a real soldier, soldier, so to speak, during that, that period. Uh, but very quiet, uh, somewhat introverted. He didn't have a whole lot of friends. We would go out drinking and partying and, you know, trying to have a good time. And uh, he, he never was a part of that. When soldiers in his unit drank too much in nearby Junction City, McVeigh would drive them from the bar to the barracks, but for a price. I never saw him spending money hardly. Um, he would loan guys in the unit, you know, maybe $15 in one week, and next week after payday, you'd have to pay him 20 or 25 And But it was a straight-up deal. People knew, knew if you went to him that, you know, he's going to loan you a certain amount of money, but he expected something in return. More importantly, as a soldier and their sergeant, his men trusted him. Uh, he was uh, the type of person who, if you were in a hole with somebody, you would want to be there with Tim because you could bet that Tim was going to be the person who would come out alive and you just might too if you were along with him. He is a self-described survivalist. He uh, would, uh, you know, talked about a certain shelter or a bunker and uh, having weapons in there and guns in there, a place to go in case, you know, perhaps the apocalypse you know, hit or something like that, that he would have a place to go and survive. Uh, he, he attended gun shows every now and then, uh, and uh, where you would find uh, different publications about how possibly one day uh, America was going to take the right to own arms away from the people. He uh, seemed to, um, was afraid the, the government may take his guns away, may infringe upon his, uh, his rights as a gun owner. He had a distrust of the government, definitely, at that time. Uh, I never sensed in any way at that time that he had a hatred for the government at all. During his stay at Fort Riley, Kansas, McVeigh had been selected to try out for the Special Forces, the exclusive Green Berets, his dream assignment in the military. And had trained extensively for it, doing hundreds of push-ups and hundreds of sit-ups every day, carrying 100 pounds of gear 13, 15 miles a day to get himself in the physical condition for the course. The Gulf War changed that for him. Sergeant Timothy McVeigh was an expert gunner on a Bradley fighting machine. He and his unit, parts of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, were sent to the Gulf and were in place, ready for war by January 1991. McVeigh, not yet 22, would get his first taste of combat, his first kill, his first medals, and a deeper distrust of his government. Timothy McVeigh was only 22 when in January 1991, he arrived in Saudi Arabia, ready to fight for his country. He was a gunner on a Bradley fighting team and a leader in his platoon. And he was well known for being an excellent shot already. He was cleaning his weapon a lot. He always made sure that his weapon was, uh, was ready to fire. During the weeks that his unit waited for the war to start, McVeigh and his men were up every morning at 4.30. The days in the trenches were hot, the nights cold and long. We would stay in those trenches until the light came, make coffee and build a fire and sit around and, and drink it. And, and that was it until the sun came out. and. Uh, 
We would basically watch over that desert to see if anything came, and we did that every day up until the ground war started. After sitting on the border of Kuwait for almost six weeks, once the ground war finally started, McVeigh's unit was quickly in the thick of the action. McVeigh had been trained to kill on sight and wasted no time pulling the trigger. With the uh, Bradley vehicle that he was on, he took a shot at one man, uh, alone, standing in the desert, and uh, actually blew the guy's head right off. Now. He was screaming and yelling when he did this. But he told us that he had shot an Iraqi soldier's head off at approximately 1,000 meters, I think, and that he was somewhat bragging about that. The desert fighting continued. McVeigh and his unit pushed forward where they found Iraqi soldiers hiding in bunkers. They basically gave a few warning shots telling these soldiers to come out of hiding and uh, some did, some didn't, and those who didn't were buried alive uh, by the unit that he was with. McVeigh's unit took over 650 ground casualties the first day that they went across the Iraqi border. They uh, incurred a great deal of death and destruction. Actually seeing people die on the killing fields because of what he was doing was something that affected him very deeply. It was not what he had originally imagined would be service for the U.S. Army. Sergeant Timothy McVeigh was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor and the Combat Infantry Badge for his part in the fighting. When the war ended, his unit was part of the security force assigned to guard General Norman Schwarzkopf in Saudi Arabia. Suddenly, he was told to return to the United States. His long-desired wish to try out for the special forces, his revered Green Berets, had finally become a reality. He was getting everything ready. He was happy. He was excited. He was moving, you know, because he was going to the special forces. McVeigh got on a troop transport, went home on a brief leave for about a week. After arriving in Fort Riley, Kansas, McVeigh's first stop was his favorite restaurant, the Rock House Tavern. He still was, had his clothes he wore from Saudi, you know, he still had, in fact, he still had sand on him. And uh, he told me, he said, I just got off the plane, and he said, all I could, could think about was your food, your breakfast and your burgers. And he said, um, he said, it helped me make it through that over there. One week later, Sergeant Timothy McVeigh was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, undergoing the strenuous Special Forces tryout. But he was not the soldier he had been before the war in the Gulf. After living in the desert for four months, he was physically drained, uh, particularly the desert conditions. His equipment was wore out. One of the tests was for him to carry a 45-pound sack with him on a long journey. He was wearing new boots. His ankles were aching. His body and mind were physically out of shape. His feet were blistered. His ankle was sprained. At that point, McVeigh knew he could not pass the physically grueling Special Forces tests. It was the most devastating thing that had ever happened to him. And he sent a written notice to the camp supervisor, a voluntary statement of withdrawal. It reads, I am not physically ready. It was his first failure in the military, and his buddies saw a, really a, an altered McVeigh when he returned from that experience. Uh, he was somebody who had succeeded in everything in the military before. Now he had failed, uh, and he seemed somewhat embittered and soured. After washing out of the Green Berets, McVeigh returned to his old army base in Fort Riley, Kansas. He was restless and moved off base, but could not settle in any one place for long. He read and reread the Turner Diaries, a book he discovered in survivalist magazines. The Turner Diaries is this novel about race war in America where this uh, group of white supremacists basically take over the country, take blacks and Jews and people that are married and mix you know, marriages, hang them up from the lamppost. I mean, just this really apocalyptic novel. Timothy McVeigh loved it. He became more and more angry with the government and thought that this fictional book could somehow become a reality, uh, some type of uh, Orwellian uh, 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 prediction and he read this book more and more often. McVeigh carefully read the newspapers and became angry over what he considered unwarranted arrests, many gun and drug related that were made by the federal government. 
He was someone who increasingly read and spent time with conspiracy-oriented right-wing type books. McVeigh still collected guns and he would sit in his room and clean them in his spare time. He was becoming more of a loner every day. Then, to the surprise of everyone, on December 31st, 1991, he took an early discharge from the Army and went home. Many were puzzled by his decision to abandon what had appeared to be a promising career. By all accounts, he went back home as a 23-year-old war hero and led a fairly normal and ordinary life. Uh, got a full-time job, uh, dated a couple girls up there, and uh, worked as a supervisor at the security company. He stayed in Lockport for a while. He wrote a couple letters to the Union Sun and Journal, the local newspaper, detailing how unhappy he was with certain government laws, certain practices he had seen uh, going on in the government. About a year after getting back, uh, he just started to drift. He wanted to go out west. He was drawn to the desert from the Desert War experience. So the teenager who called himself the wanderer on his computer became a drifter never staying in one place long enough to put down roots. He would link up with his old army buddy, Terry Nichols, steeping himself in anti-government philosophy, visiting gun shows, and flirting with the newly emerging militias. Timothy McVeigh was on a journey that seemed to have no end. In the winter of 1993, 24-year-old Timothy McVeigh left the isolation of Pendleton, New York, he headed west, eventually moving to Kingman, Arizona. Although he was unable to stay in one place for long, he never forgot his years of training in the Army. Tim basically became a lost soldier. He was somebody who uh, still lived by a soldier's rules, uh, still dressed as if he was still in the military, maintained his uh, military haircut. McVeigh visited Michael Fortier, an Army friend from Fort Riley. Fortier, who was already in, in Kingman, an army buddy of his, seemed to have had connections with some remnants of a group called the Arizona Patriots, which was a right-wing paramilitary group. He was staying with the Fortiers, and they recall him taking soup cans uh, from out of the cupboard and placing them on the floor of their uh, trailer home. and showing how a bombing could occur. In Kingman, McVeigh found part-time work, once again in security, and rented a home in the Canyon West trailer park. He was an excellent tenant. He, uh, we cleaned the trailers, but he went in and re-cleaned it. Uh, he he uh, washed my curtains and, and, and ru accidentally ruined them, so uh, I, uh, I told him I'd have to take that out of his deposit, and uh, he said, oh, that's fine, no problem. He generally had money, Ever since he was in junior high school, Tim was very frugal. He always saved his money and always tried to uh, keep a good, good stash of money uh, set aside, just like he would set aside food, just in case something happened. He had rifles laying up against the corners of the walls. He didn't have a gun case, so he had his guns laying up against the, the walls and uh, you know, two or three in, in, in several corners in the house. McVeigh spent much of his free time at gun shows around the country. He lived a fairly austere lifestyle. If he was traveling, he would pull over and just put out a sleeping bag and camp as opposed to get a hotel room. McVeigh continued to drift through the middle of America, increasingly convinced of a conspiracy at the highest level of the federal government to deny so-called patriots such as himself their Second Amendment right to bear arms. McVeigh found further proof of a government out of control in the August 1992 standoff between federal agents and white supremacist Randy Weaver in Ruby Ridge, Idaho, when FBI sharpshooters killed Weaver's wife and son. Randy Weaver became a hero to people because his home had been, uh, in their view, invaded by agents who wanted to take his guns and arrest him. McVeigh also openly supported the Branch Davidians when federal agents surrounded their compound in Waco, Texas. There are surveillance photographs of Timothy James McVeigh in March of 1993 standing outside of the Branch Davidian compound protesting the presence of federal law enforcement and military personnel. On April 19, 1993, federal agents stormed the Branch Davidian compound. 
When the smoke cleared, 86 men, women, and children were dead. That action by federal agents against what McVeigh considered innocent people confirmed his greatest fears and apocalyptic fantasies. A paranoia stoked by the inflammatory rhetoric of films like Red Dawn and novels like The Turner Diaries. The Davidian compound caught fire. Tim watched it and basically began crying and screaming at the television about what was going on. The raids that had been predicted in the Turner Diaries were coming true. The Turner Diaries had become McVeigh's Bible. When not selling the book at half price, he gave copies away at gun shows. And the book, uh, if I recall correctly, I think on page 38, describes in great detail how shortly after 9 o'clock in the morning, the hero of the book with some friends uh, put together a truck bomb of approximately 5,000 pounds of fertilizer and fuel and blow up. In this case, the federal building was the FBI office in Washington, but otherwise it's remarkably similar to what happened in Oklahoma City. In November 1993, the Brady Bill was passed, requiring a waiting period for the purchase of all handguns. For many on the political fringe, this was a watershed event and the cause of a new wave of panic. Owning a gun was a symbol of liberty. Once the federal government could begin to curtail those rights, what would be next? So all those issues combined to really uh, get the militia movement uh, started in the beginning of 1994, and there were also issues that in, in Timothy McVeigh's own life seemed to resonate for similar reasons. In the first months of 1994, McVeigh continued what appeared to be his aimless drifting. He visited his old army friend, Terry Nichols, in Michigan. There have been reports that Timothy McVeigh attended a few meetings of the newly formed Michigan militia, and perhaps other militias as well. Uh, Mr. McVeigh, first of all, denies that he ever went to any militia meetings. As a soldier, he basically indicated that he was not really particularly impressed with most of the militia organizers that he personally had seen on the gun show circuit or been familiar with their literature. There is no evidence that Mr. McVeigh joined any militias or for that matter any other extremist groups. How many meetings he did or did not attend uh, is, is not you know, an important thing if he is following the ideology and the basic philosophy of what these types of groups should do. In March 1994, McVeigh went underground and dropped out of sight. Though he never stayed in one place for long, he was occasionally spotted at gun shows in Nevada and Kansas and frequently visited Terry Nichols in Decker, Michigan. In September and October 1994, authorities say that McVeigh and Terry Nichols bought large quantities of ammonium nitrate, an essential ingredient for making homemade bombs. The two men traveled over the back roads and small towns of the Corn Belt until April 14, 1995 when McVeigh moved to the Dreamland Motel in Junction City, Kansas. The young man seemed to be a kind, outgoing person. He was friendly, he didn't take a lot of time up. He came and go, did go as a regular customer. Not like some people who come in are distraught or depressed and I have to pay attention to him. He seemed to be a nice guy, right? Like your next door boy. On April 17th, authorities say McVeigh used a fake driver's license to rent a rider truck in Junction City, Kansas. On April 18th, he was reportedly seen driving the truck and filling it with gas. A trucker said he saw the truck loaded with sealed blue plastic barrels in the cargo bay. During this time, experts began to pick up the rumblings of anti-government activity from right-wing groups across the country. Well, we can't use you if you're sniveling and afraid to take back liberty. If the liberty tree is to survive, it has to be watered with the blood of tyrants and with patriots from time to time that it might live. I guess it's time for us to water the tree. The great fear was that April 19th, the second anniversary of the federal raid on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, would galvanize the most violent impulses on the extreme right. It was the ideological equivalent of Pearl Harbor. Uh, and the folks in the movement started talking about this as Militia Day. And it was clear that something was going to happen someplace in the country. At approximately 8.40 in the morning on April 19, 1995, a slow-moving rider truck was seen near the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. At 9 a.m., a tall man was seen hurrying away from the parked truck. At 9.02 a.m., 
truck exploded with tremendous force, blowing out nine floors of the building. The nation now had to come to grips with the shock of this unprecedented event and the reality of terrorism in the American heartland. On April 19, 1995, a blast devastated the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. The bomb went off just as hundreds of people had showed up for work, just as children had been dropped off at a daycare center on the second floor. 168 people including 19 children died in the attack and more than 500 were injured. Within minutes, a valiant rescue effort was underway. Soon after, an intense manhunt began to find the bombers. We will find the people who did this. When we do, justice will be swift, certain, and severe. That morning, Timothy McVeigh, had been speeding down a rural Oklahoma highway in his dust-covered yellow mercury. Within hours of the blast, he was pulled over by a sharp-eyed highway patrolman, although the FBI would not be aware of this for a few days. 10.20 a.m., uh, which was 75 minutes after the explosion, Trooper Charlie Hanger uh, stopped the vehicle for not having a tag displayed. During the ensuing conversation, he noticed a bulge under the fellow's jacket that he immediately took to be a gun in a shoulder holster. Police say the pistol McVeigh carried was loaded with illegal armor-piercing bullets. He was arrested and jailed in Perry, Oklahoma, where he supplied them with his real name and social security number. Meanwhile, the FBI had found a piece of McVeigh's truck at the Murrah building. This led them to the truck rental office, where they obtained physical descriptions of two men. The following day, the FBI released sketches of these men. The manager of the Dreamland Hotel soon identified John Doe No. 1 as Timothy McVeigh, and his name was entered into a national crime computer. By the next morning, April 21st, the FBI had located him still sitting in the Perry, Oklahoma jail. He had been only hours from release. Investigators breathed a sigh of relief. When the FBI arrived to question McVeigh, he would only give them his name, height, and weight. They were struck by his composure and his military demeanor. Here is a guy that has this never-ending loop-type tape running through his mind. He's running through his mind that I'm a soldier. I went on a mission. I got caught on my mission but I'm still a good soldier. McVeigh was held as a suspect in the bombing and was brought back to Oklahoma City where he faced angry crowds. Soon after, Terry Nichols gave himself up to the local police in Michigan. By August 1995, both McVeigh and Nichols were indicted by a grand jury in Oklahoma City. They would eventually face separate trials. As McVeigh's attorneys prepared his case, their client was already facing public rage. Since the case aroused such intense feelings in Oklahoma City, it was moved to Denver, Colorado to ensure a fair trial. There, on April 24, 1997, just over two years after the attack, the trial of the United States versus Timothy James McVeigh began. He was accused of the largest mass murder in American history. McVeigh refused to take the stand and showed little emotion during the trial. On June 2nd, he was convicted on all 11 counts, including using a weapon of mass destruction. Many of the victims' families rejoiced when they heard the news. McVeigh was sentenced to death and was transferred to a federal prison in Florence, Colorado. Within this supermax facility, McVeigh lived in a unit reserved for the worst offenders. It sort of reminded me of, of the cells in, in Silence of the Lambs. The first cell was Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. And next to him was Ramzi Youssef, the bomber responsible for the World Trade Center bombing. Then we got to the end of the row, and there, as I looked in through the plexiglass, there was Tim McVeigh. He had literally taken his place alongside some of the most infamous criminals of his time, spending 23 hours a day in his cell. Eventually, he admitted his guilt to two reporters from the Buffalo News. He later said he regretted that children had been killed, but never expressed any remorse over his actions. He always claimed the victims were collateral damage. 
he talks about it in tactical terms as a military man, never in terms of remorse, never in terms of the pain that he called, caused to all those people in Oklahoma City. In 1999, McVeigh was transferred to death row in the federal penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. He made a few attempts to appeal his conviction, but all failed. Finally, on December 12, 2000, he asked a federal judge to halt any appeals on his behalf and set an execution date. It was set for May 16, 2001. It's a joke to Tim McVeigh. You can't punish him. He, he sees it as a win-win situation. He's been able to manipulate the media to get his mess anti-government message out. And he's also getting his ticket out of life, which holds no joy for him. McVeigh prepared to become the first federal prisoner to be put to death since 1963. He even won a decision that prevented the government from performing an autopsy on his body. It seemed McVeigh's story was drawing to a close. But then, on May 11, 2001, just five days before his execution, U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft made a startling announcement. The FBI had failed to turn over thousands of pages of evidence to McVeigh's defense attorneys. I have made a decision to postpone the execution of Timothy McVeigh for one month. The execution was postponed until June 11. While the government claimed these documents would not have a significant impact on McVeigh's case, his defense team scrambled to request a stay of execution in light of this new information. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got a lot of documents to review. We've got legal research to do. We need to have serious conversations with our client. In the end, his lawyer's last-ditch efforts were to no avail. 33-year-old Timothy McVeigh was executed by lethal injection on June 11, 2001. At his request, none of his family members attended the execution. McVeigh was cremated and his ashes scattered. Today in Oklahoma City, the devastated Murrah building is gone. No rubble remains to mark Timothy McVeigh's notorious place in American history. At the site, a memorial now stands, 168 empty chairs, one for every victim, commemorate the innocent lives lost on that one unimaginable day of horror in 1995.